Are there any Le Mans fans in the house? Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> well, one here's Le someone. Fan. You, you will like Le Mans if you didn't already. Alan, welcome. Happy New Year. Have a seat. Happy New Year to everybody as well. Thanks for out-queuing me there and just wandering on randomly. Well, you were going to ramble on, I think, for about five minutes, so I thought we'd uh, put everybody out of their misery in that one. Um, Happy New Year. Um, how do you reflect on 2011? We'll get that out of the way quickly, I think. Well, I think if you take my season, it uh, is probably reflected in about 10 seconds. Not very good, not very... Uh, not the results we hoped for. We had a lot of speed, but we didn't convert them into anything except for probably the most memorable thing was a huge accident at Le Mans. Um, but it, all in all, uh, it actually gave a lot of confidence for the future because the pure performance of the R18 was a lot stronger than what we had in the past. And uh, we just need to convert that speed into race results, which is uh, where a lot of the effort went towards the end of last year and looking through into 2012. I don't think people appreciate that fundamentally the, the, the difference in the science you apply to a prototype when you put a windscreen on it. And it took a uh, while to get used to that, didn't it? I don't think it was just purely that. If you look at uh, quite a lot of factors now in sports car racing, uh, back in 2009, for example, uh, the first race of the year was in Sebring, and there was 33 cars on the grid. And uh, for the first round of the World Championship in 2012, there's going to be 64 cars on the grid. So there's nearly double the amount of traffic. Then when you add into it that a uh, bigger percentage of that traffic is a GT car, so you've got bigger speed differentials. Then when we were talking about speed differentials, on the straights, we're maybe about six or seven miles per hour quicker than the slowest car. But in the corners, we could be 60 or 70 miles per hour. So it sort of concertinas everybody up going into you know, the corners. And ultimately, two into one doesn't go. And when you've got five into one, as we had, say, at Petit Le Mans, then it certainly doesn't go and, and things happen. But that's part of it. It's always been part of it. The, the job is when the race starts, you've got to be first to get to the checkered flag. However you do it, whatever you do, whether it's in Formula Ford at Snetterton or whether it's at Le Mans or in Formula One, that is the purpose of the job. And so you've got to make sure you do that better than the rest. There were a number of incidents last year, weren't there, where you get involved with a slower car. You at Le Mans and Rocky, of course, who had another terrifying accident and same thing happened to you at Silverstone it's a real strange thing isn't it the, the big guys versus the little guys and who's right I think when there's no clear-cut situation you can't say anybody's right you know uh, as I said the the line is narrow the road is narrow and sometimes it just doesn't work out like at Le Mans for example I didn't see the Ferrari coming down into me. It was uh, Beltoise, who's you know a pretty experienced guy, uh, but he also did not see me at all on the right hand side. He didn't see out the right hand side of his car. So, you know that I the first thing I knew was I was going backwards across the gravel trap. I had no clue what I'd hit at all. Absolutely nothing whatsoever. And then I just waiting for the impact, and so I couldn't blame him because you know, he was doing everything that he thought was right, and, and I thought I was doing everything I thought was right. And it just uh, conspired that it wasn't, uh, obviously it, two into one didn't go. But the thing I, I suppose about that was after the pretty spectacular shunt and the fact that I was the first person I think that realized I was okay while everybody back in the pits or on television and, or at home and you know, was a little bit more concerned for the safety, the worst I had was a small graze just down the front of my shin, which was not from the shunt. It was actually from when I popped the door, once it had been righted onto its wheels, and I climbed out that I grazed it on the back of the steering column getting out. So in reality, from 150, 160 mile an hour big cartwheel to come out with a small grazed shin and feeling a little bit dizzy for you know a few minutes was uh, quite a spectacular feat for the amount of safety that they've built into these cars and how protected we actually are. Has everybody seen the, the images of Alan and the crash at Le Mans? Uh, you'll be one of maybe six million that was on YouTube within 24 yeah. hours, which was, to be honest, one of the first things that shocked me because, as I said, I didn't really know what had happened. I knew I had a bit of a shunt. I'd gone to hospital. I was checked out, you know, and after our own team doctors released me about 12 hours later, I went back to the hotel, and the next morning I saw L'Equipe newspaper, which is a French national sports newspaper, and it was sitting at reception where you come down for breakfast, and there was a picture of a car that was basically vertical above the barrier. I thought, who the hell's that? 
And then I realized it was our car, and at which point I thought, I better go and have a look at this. So I went onto YouTube just to see, and there was just lists upon lists, and you know, two million, five hundred thousand, all this sort of stuff, of people having posted it and already viewed it. And it w I can tell you right now, it was much more frightening watching it than actually being in it, which sounds bizarre, but uh, the, like I said, you're sitting with the best of safety around and about you, so that's not to be blasé about it, but you do know that uh, the, the car is strong to the point where actually I, when I went back to the circuit later on, I walked up to the chief designer and gave him a smacking big kiss on the forehead, much to his very nervousness, I have to say, as I was I hope that's not on him. YouTube. <laughs> no, 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 it certainly isn't, but there's a very gruff German, you can imagine that, uh, how that was taken. But at the end of the day, you know, his effort and detail and his team's effort and detail allowed me to be sitting here, if we're honest about it. People say, oh, why don't the guys in the LMP1 cars just wait? Just be a fraction more patient. But when you end up winning a 24-hour race by 13 seconds, right. cumulatively, if you wait each time, you're going to lose. Well, if you look at it this year, and this year I think is a good example of everything that's gone on, uh, 2008, we beat Peugeot by six seconds at Petit Le Mans. We beat them by, in 09 at Sebring, by 13 seconds. Le Mans this year was 13 seconds. And if you take Le Mans 13 seconds, that's less than one-tenth of a second per lap difference over the 24 hours. So you say wait in that circumstance if I'd seen him and then waited, I would have lost three, four seconds. So if you do that four times, you've lost Le Mans. And that's how competitive it is. And that's where now we're forcing the boundaries of everything. And, uh, you know, you talk about the technology, we really pushed ahead with the aero efficiency of the R18. This year, we found that we gained a lot of top speed. We found we gained fuel economy. Okay, there was aerodynamic. We got improved the stability and everything else. But as a whole package, it was a more efficient package, which allowed us to get into the situation where, even though Rocky and I had tested the car for their strength and rigidity and safety, the third car, the sister car, went on to, to win. And uh, that's one of the, <coughs> I think, one of the really good parts about Le Mans nowadays is that the manufacturers coming in are really starting to, I would say, extend the boundaries of what we've normally known as the norm. It started in 06 with the diesel, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what the next three or four years bring as well, because they're certainly taking big steps in the front. Audi have battled really hard with Peugeot for five seasons now, and it was as close as ever last year, wasn't it? There was, there was absolutely nothing to call between them. I think, well, actually, yesterday I was in Germany. I was in Ingolstadt at Audi, and we were going through some of last year's stats, which is the sort of boring side of being a racing driver, where you sit down and you go through the resume of the year and all the details. And in reality, it was a tenth of a second was the maximum speed difference between the two cars roughly through the year. And you saw that in the races. You saw that in how at Silverstone, anybody that was there at the 1,000 kilometers, um, it was a really a close battle, a wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle, like it was a 10-lap sprint race at the beginning. And that's the way that it, it has to be. And it's built up. Uh, over the last few years, and I think it's been one of the exciting parts for everybody involved and also, you know, everybody going to see the races or watching in television because it's been enthralling racing, absolutely enthralling racing. And you know that if you slip up once, it's gone. But you know you've also got to be on the attack all the time or it's gone as well. And that's, what we're, that's why we started. That's why, you know, I started karting back in 1981. It was because of that enjoyment of the racing, and that's something that we've got in droves at the moment. There was an uh, issue over the tyres, weren't there, with Audi and Peugeot? And it, there were uh, scenarios where entire teams were switching their strategies because the other guys suddenly had their tyres switching on. Well, that's, I think, uh, that word, or the word switching on, I think, has been something that you've heard a lot about in the last few years about making tyres work, and it's the key. We've been working with Michelin since uh, they started in sports cars in 99, and... It's about making that tyre work on that day in that right time. And it's, unlike Formula One, we've got open tyres, so we can develop our own tyres. We can have three or four different compounds, constructions, whatever it may be, for different times in the race. And Le Mans was a good example of that, where at certain times uh, we were significantly quicker than the opposition, and then other times they were a bit quicker than us. And it was just when you were in the tyre window and when you were out. But the key always is to make your tyres work. 
because if you don't, they're the things that keep you on the ground. You know, you're, otherwise you just slide, and if you slide, then you're slow, and you use the tire more, and it goes on from there. But uh, I think that whole process is something that also brings Michelin to this part of the sport as well, because they can then start to develop their own technology where they're restricted in other areas. Very exciting times ahead for sports car racing. We've got Toyota coming back uh, in LMP1. We've got uh, HPD, which is Honda's kind of performance division. Good news, isn't it? Yeah, it's superb news. They, you know, and it's also the, the thing, I think, which brings it all together is uh, a thing called the World Endurance Championship, which is something that, as a driver, you always want to be fighting for the, the biggest prize that you can. And uh, as much as the American Le Mans series a few years ago was effectively a world championship because everybody was there, you didn't have uh, that title at the end of the season to, to talk about. And, it, and that's something that I think really brings the focus. And for the drivers as well as for the manufacturers, you said Toyota coming back. I drove for them the last time they were in sports cars and then on to in Formula One. And uh, they're very keen to bring this title and also Le Mans to Japan because that's something that they miss. They really, that's a bad thing for them not to have won that. And uh, they want to do that. Obviously, Audi want to ensure that doesn't happen. Peugeot want to ensure that they get it. And then you've got HPD, which, as you say, is effectively Honda. And uh, they're coming in with more cars now. And I think it does set itself up to be one of the glory years of sports car racing because now it's not just two manufacturers but it's effectively four that's going to be fighting there at the front in LMP. Then you've got LMP2 and then you've got the droves, you know, whether it be BMW or Porsche or Ferrari uh, into the GT category as well. And these boys as well now. Yes, and these guys GT, coming in. GT has yep. gone crazy, hasn't it? Well, I think now it's getting the focus as opposed to going crazy. It's always been big in numbers, but uh, now the status of the championships lifted itself up and the status of the cars as well. And to see these cars racing, because effectively, especially I think the McLaren, because it's a, it's a racing company. It's been born and bred out of racing, and then it should be on a racing track as opposed to on a, on a road, if you ask me. I think that's one of the nice things about it. And so I look forward to seeing these cars out there fighting for it, because as an LMP driver, you actually see the GT race quite a lot when you come around to lap them, so you actually see it going on and developing. It, uh, it can be quite exciting at times. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask Alan one more question about something um, slightly extracurricular. Um, he's back on later on. Uh, if there's anything we haven't covered, uh, then do, uh, do please shout later on. He's got a very busy schedule, so got to let him go. Just quickly, uh, Group B. Uh, yeah. Short wheelbase, Sport Quattro. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, throttle lag like a turbo lag like a cross channel ferry awesome I don't know if uh, the guys designing the turbo and the engine would very much appreciate you calling it a cross channel ferry but uh, I had the opportunity just before Christmas uh, to drive the Group B rally car and it was the Quattro was unbelievable because it, you know I, I stood in a few forests at Gub Hill and the A forest uh, near Dumfries from where, where I'm from in the early 80s and watched these things come in chirping or heard them coming chirping through the forest and round the hairpin at the farm and then accelerating off. And as a young impressionable kid, you know, you were dodging the stones flying at you, but it was a, just a fantastic sight and sound and smell and everything. And, uh, you know, with uh, fan legendary names driving them as well. And then you get a chance later on in your life. And you, I was transported back to being that sort of 11, 12-year-old, 13-year-old kid again. And it was, uh, it was a really bizarre thing, because the first thing I thought is, crikey, I'm sitting vertical in the car. You just sit so much up in comparison to what I'm used to, where you're lying down into it. And then you put it into gear, and it's kind of like a road car in terms of you just put it into gear, and you drop the clutch, and you drive off. But then it, it's not got a lot of power. But as soon as that turbo comes in, which is, there is a lot of turbo lag, it goes. It's just like takes off. It's like someone hits a blooming rocket behind you and poof, off this thing goes. And you're hanging on. And it's not tracking itself perfectly. So it sort of dances around and shakes around and change gear and then bang, the turbo chirp and off you go again. And this is only going straight. I've not even got to the twisty section at this moment in time. And I'm hanging on to this blooming thing. And what I realized is when you drive it like you do a normal modern car, it understeers unbelievably bad. It's just... That's what I meant about the cross-channel ferry. 
Ah, well, so I'm sure turning the wheel and waiting for weeks what for something I'll do to happen. Is I'll give you the telephone number of the guy that designed this front suspension, and then you can speak to him about the cross channel ferry reference then. But the you know, you turn in and you put the throttle on and it just understeers and then the turbo lag comes in and then it goes boo and then suddenly it'll pick up and then it's boom, it all takes off. And the car literally just takes off. And what I found is first of all, you must left foot brake. Categorically must left foot brake. Second thing is you must throw the car into the corner and you must keep that engine on song. Because when it's on song, the car becomes alive. It's two cars in effect. You know, it's a very docile sort of lumbering car. And then as soon as you make it, you know, get it into the power band, then crikey, this thing just is alive and it's on the toes and then it's dancing and then you can play with it. Then you can be precise with it and float it through the corners and make it work and make it fast and make it look good. If you drive it like we do modern racing cars, then you make it look bad. So at the end of the day, I thought, first of all, it's hot, it's noisy, it's hard, it's really quite tricky to drive and to get it consistent. But it was so, so much fun. They were great days, weren't they? And a real uh, experience for you, I'm sure. Um, I've got to let you go, which is a shame. But you will be back later on at a uh, quick scan of the okay. schedule. Quarter past three with okay. your old mate, Tom Christensen. Ladies and gentlemen, for the time being, put, it to, put your hands together for Alan McNish. Thank you very much. Hope you all enjoy the day.